I'm going to talk a little bit about how the, um, a little bit, some, a few stories from the book, show some photos from the book, so some photos that aren't in the book, and tell a few stories, a little bit how the book came together and, uh, and the story of the West End in the 1970s and 80s. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an interesting time. You know, a lot of my, a lot of the books that I, and a lot of stuff I work on, tends to be around the theme of that Vancouver has done a very good job bringing the new, but we haven't done the best job of keeping the old. And that goes not only for some buildings, but also for our own memories and maybe what the city, how, how the city's changed in really within our own lifetime. One of the, one of the things that, um, one of the markers of this in the West End is the West End Sex, uh, the West End Sex Workers Memorial that was unveiled in September of 2016. It's really the only marker left of these times. Um, if you walk, if you lived in Vancouver the last 20 years, maybe you moved here 20 years ago, maybe you moved here 30 years ago, um, or you're new to the city, you would probably have no idea that uh, the West End was as turbulent as it got in the late 70s and early 1980s. It's a time that seems we've maybe been happy to forget, or some people have wanted to forget to a certain extent. And uh, that was an interesting idea to me. Um, for those of you not familiar with the West End Sex Workers Memorial, as I say, it was placed in September 2016 there. Um, it's the uh, shape of a lamppost. It's interesting, the, actually, the, the top, the light in the lamppost was, up until Vancouver Vice came out, was kind of a turned pink. It wasn't so red anymore. And then I was down there a couple weeks ago, and it was now bright red. Somebody must have, I think I made a comment about that in the book, and somebody at the city must have seen that and jockeyed on a nice red lamp there and, and fixed it uh, and whatnot. So it makes me think I should write about other, put other complaints in the book and <laughs> maybe see if I can change a few things in the city that way. But it was interesting because it, uh, there was n the, the, the placement of it uh, and uh, the arrival of that in the West End did not, come out, did not come without some controversy. There was even a petition to remove it. Um, in, as, in as much as it had a lot of support. Um, you know, there were a lot of maybe some older residents of the West End that remembered those times uh, that uh, were dead against it. Um, there was a petition online to remove it. Didn't go far, but it I was surprised to read some of that stuff. It was founded um, by Jamie Lee Hamilton and Becky Ross, a UBC professor. And it's interesting because at the time, they uh, did a number of interviews and, and published some material how they talked about how uh, this was really the golden age of prostitution in Vancouver, in their mind. Um, this, you know, there was the assertion that there were no pimps working in the West End at the time. The women supported each other and themselves and, and whatnot and looked out for one another. Um, you know, Ross and Hamlin even suggested that it was a boon of economics to the West End because it brought traffic into the West End and the, and the sex workers themselves were spending money in the West End. Um, and uh, the the real marker of it, the real news that it garnered at the time was it talked about how the eventual injunction that what pushed the sex workers out of the West End during these years uh, unfortunately led them to being pushed into other areas of town that basically led them right up to Willie Pickton's door. Um, so it was a pretty sobering time of sort of self-reflection in the West End. If you, again, if you were newer to Vancouver, you might not have any idea that it was uh, some of the history of this. Um, and it's, as I say, it's interesting that the Today, the, the, the memorial itself is really the only marker um, in the West End of these times. Aside from, if you go to some streets and you probably maybe walk down Pendrel, and this is at Pendrel and Nicola, which is the cover of the book as well, and you think, well, that's just a pathway. Well, that used to be traffic that went through that pathway. There was a number of streets that were barricaded uh, at the time in November 1981. We just had the 40th anniversary of it. And that's one sort of thing left over, but there's even a secret in that that I'll get to uh, uh, in a moment. If I showed you this picture and I said, what, uh, uh, this picture of Strathcona, what would you say to me? You'd, be you'd say, Aaron, you'd be lying. You're lying because that's not Strathcona, that's the West End. This is a Fred Herzog photo from 1957. Um, the West End looks remarkably different today, of course. Um, but it's interesting to note that what happened um, in the, this, it's taken, I think, from the, Bar the Barard Bridge from my angle anyway. Um, and it's interesting that it, to look back around this time because it, while all this is going on with the vice squad and police in the West End at that time, um, there's also a real sort of change that happens in the na very nature of the West End and the residential nature of, of that end of town. There's a great film that you could look on YouTube called West End 66, and it's got a nice breezy jazz score to it, uh, and you see cars driving by, convertibles, and people in swimsuits and bikinis down by uh, English Bay, and it probably looks to 
you know, people who live in Red Deer, uh, as this is the most foreign, this is not Canada, surely. Uh, this own, own little oasis that we have here that's different from the rest of the country. Even today, I, whenever you, I've lived almost every neighborhood in Vancouver over the years, and uh, except for Denman Street, along Denman, I never lived down there. And every time I go down to Denman Street, there's palm trees down there in the summer. It feels like so Californian. It feels like a different reality altogether down there. It feels like I'm on vacation when I go down to Denman Street. It's, oh, it's, uh, and that's what it looks like in this film, because the promise of the West End that was heralded in the mid-1960s uh, was something that was quite unique. Um, it was, uh, you know, this was sort of maybe what they sort of talked about with Yale Town at the beginning, you know, maybe before things change or whatnot, but the, the dream and the promise of a new neighborhood like this. Um, it's uh, around, uh, around the, um, in the late 1950s, really going to the 1960s, um, uh, this is the, or I should, I'm going to show this photo actually first, which is a 7, 1700 block of Davy Street. There's a, um, in the 1950s, there was a uh, zoning laws changed that allowed a lot more four to six story walk-ups. Um, and within a few years of that, um, a number of uh, high-rise apartment buildings, like the previous one, I, oops, I'll show you, like that, uh, started to really change the face of the West End. A building boom in the 1960s between 1959 and 1972, uh, more than uh, about 220 high-rise buildings went up in the West End. That's just within just over a 10-year time span. Um, I don't know if the city's seen. I mean, the downtown Vancouver changed, began to change in the 90s. You know, started to sort of really start realization in the last few years, but this is all, this is compressed in the West End to a really just a 12, 13 year period where there are some of these these buildings go up, and the and the density uh, of that end of town, uh, and as the West End '66 film shows, it attracts all manner of sort of young professionals and singles, uh, and it's a great situation because now all these people are out on their own. There's no parents to watch them. They have money. They have jobs. The rent is good. There's a beach down by the road. They, maybe there's a pool in their building. And now they can meet other singles in the building from everywhere from the beach to the laundry room in their building. And it creates quite a party uh, that happens down there. And it also, as my friend Gordon Price uh, says, the gay people were along for the ride too. And they, and they, uh, they found a home there now. And it's interesting to sort of note that, uh, you know, in interviewing some residents of Vancouver in the 19, who lived here in the 1950s, people are quite old, 80s and 90s, they knew the West End as sort of, they didn't have the name for it then, but the, the, we do now, the Gaberhood uh, that we call it now. It was, known, it was known as that too. So the history of, uh, of, of that community goes back probably as best as I can tell. It wasn't really printed in the newspapers because it wasn't something we talked about back then. But probably in the 1930s, 1940s, uh, they were cheap places to live. You could live on your own, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a rooming house with a bunch of guys having a party wouldn't attract any more attention than any other kind of community. So it, it kind of became this, uh, not only a safe place, but a cheap place and a welcome place to live by all accounts. Um, and, uh, but with that also comes uh, crime, of course. And it's interesting because in the 1950s, there are a number of murders in the West End that get referred to as the bachelor murders. And I want to thank my friend Tom Carter uh, for helping me with some of the research on this and pointing some of the stuff out. Tom's in the back of the room there. Thank you, Tom. And these were a number of, um, a number of murders of uh, gay men that had uh, met somebody, invited them back to their place. The person freaked out, apparently, when they came on to them, and then later went to a, 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 what was called, a, a many years, the gay panic defense. The guy came on to me. I was totally, I was at, I was at risk here, and I, I had to kill him. This, that, that defense persisted for years. Um, and there's a number of what, what you see in the, in the West End in those years, three big ones that I note in the book. And, and I think one of them, a couple of them are actually un, unsolved to this day um, of, uh, of men that were, as I say, li living alone and, and ended up getting murdered, obviously, because uh, of some of, the, some of these issues and some of these situations that goes on. That plays into some things that we deal with in the 1970s as well. So I, I wanted to point that out early. Again, the promise of the West End that, she, that starts to happen in, in the 1966, in 1966, by the 1970s, there's a change within a few short years. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a notion that, uh, uh, you know, the, the West End has, let me see if I can read this little statistic out here for me. Um, the, the very nature of, of the way the West End has changed in those years, again, as I say, the promise uh, 
of the West End you see in the mid 60s has changed. This is actually from uh, 1969. Uh, now there's always going to be small incidents. I mean, anybody who's lived in Vancouver all these years knows that the West End was never the South Bronx. Um, but again, the, the, more and more as, as the years go by in the 1970s, things begin to things begin to change, um, and some of, there's more crime problems, and and uh, and there's a lot more uh, feelings that the the prize I say the promise of the West End in the mid '60s was not necessarily happening in the 1970s. Um, prostitution in the West End is we, perhaps is the one crime problem we make too much of, and I'm, I want to underscore some other things that were happening in the city at that time too. Um, but this was a um, uh, Diane Frew in 1961 was a well known known to police anyway, uh, a West End madam who ran uh, a basically a, a, uh, a brothel out of a couple of, apartment built, a couple of apartments in the West End. And she had kind of an ingenious uh, way. She was paying off cab drivers to bring people uh, to her place. If you live next door, you might think, geez, there's a lot of guys coming, going from Suite 22, you know? Like, what's going on over there? And uh, eventually, that's sort of what attracts police attention. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's interesting, there was a, um, when the, this was a brief sensational trial in 1961 in Vancouver um, that, that happened, where all this was sort of exposed. And there were these rumors of sort of the who's who of Vancouver that had come in and out of, the, of those suites uh, in the West End. The Vancouver Sun published actually one of the, they had sort of three phone numbers, and, and Fru herself had a receptionist kind of fielding all the calls because they were so busy. And uh, the Vancouver Sun printed the phone numbers, but got one of the digits wrong. And the next day, I, you know, I, I, I wish they would. I, my, my dream is that it was some Catholic priest, of course, that his, his number got played. He was getting all these calls asking for these strange requests and stuff like that and, and whatnot. Who knows what it was, but this, I guess the, the son had to apologize the next day for the, the misprint and whatnot as somebody else had gotten all these, uh, all these phone calls or just, you know, people crank calling, if nothing else. Um, it's, uh, that was one of the sort of the biggest things, but uh, by the nature of what you can tell in sort of police blotters and the newspaper archives and um, interviews with uh, police officers over the years, uh, many of them long since passed, that, the, uh, that prostitution in the West End really had gone back to the, about the 1930s or 40s. Um, in the 1940s, there was a sweep that the VPD did to clear a number of them out that was talked about. Um, they didn't say exactly which addresses, so you couldn't go read the paper and think, geez, I've got to drop by there tomorrow and check that out. You, they, they kept it a little bit secret and whatnot. There was certainly other areas of town where that was going on, too. But it was, um, it was something that was happening in the West End. It, we have this attitude that it just happened in the 1970s. In reality, it was happening uh, you know, much earlier than that. There are all sorts of characters in the West End uh, through these years, and Alex DeCimbriani is uh, certainly one of them. Um, some of you people might remember that name or might remember who he was. Um, an interesting figure who uh, was a landlord who had uh, owned a number of uh, apartment buildings um, and uh, talked about uh, he was the mayor of, we of the West End. And he was talking, sort of threatened that one day he'd, he'd run for actual political office. Um, and it, I'll read a little story. There was a, about him here, I might, uh, if I can. Um, a, a little bit of a preamble uh, to this. In August 1974, 33-year-old Serge LaRue was found stabbed to death in a West End lane. Another shocking West End crime that would go unsolved, even unsolved today. His daughter actually recently contacted me. Um, police made their unusual appeal to the public for information. But with an additional incentive, Alex de Cimbriani, a neighborhood millionaire, self-proclaimed mayor of the West End and mayor of a city within a city, offered $10,000 to anyone who could provide information leading to an arrest. The kind of character that only Vancouver in the 1970s could produce, de Cimbriani was actually from Ontario. He arrived in 1960 and soon began dabbling in real estate, buying old rooming houses back in the days when a labor and maintenance man could afford to do so. And rather than demolish them, renovated them. His efforts provided needed affordable housing for pensioners and low-income families. By 1967, he had become the landlord of 350 suites and 100 bachelor apartments, with the province newspaper lauding him as an enterprising renovator who turns the West End potential slums into apartments for a wide, wage, a wide range of incomes, particularly around the Comox, Jervis, Broughton, and Barclay area. De Cimbriani's life story had all the uh, dramatic highlights of a latter-day Horatio Alger tale. The story went that he was born near Toronto, raised by nuns in an orphanage. He would later say that no one adopted him because of a speech impediment that caused, uh, that caused by a cleft palate. 
One day at the age of eight, he was caught stealing an apple from a grocery store by a local policeman who had become his only friend. That day, uh, he said that later the police uh, had faith in him and secretly paid for an operation for his cleft palate. De Cimbriani said he never forgot the gesture. By 1974, at the age of 32, he'd risen through the ranks of Vancouver's uh, social and political set. His property acquisitions had made him a millionaire, and he became a big donor to the Social Credit Party. Um, uh, the, or, uh, let me skip down here. He made public displays of his, uh, uh, of his influence. He designed his own crest, Irkendale, the name of his apartment complexes, and he wore a monogram, monogrammed uh, uh, symbol of it on his uh, logo of it, on his blazers. He shelled out $25,000 to host a retirement party at the Bayshore Hotel for Police Chief Constable John Fisk. He was also a financial uh, benefactor for a variety of West End cultural events. Decimbriani began to boast to the press that the mayor of the West End, a winking honorary title that bestowed no power, would run for the actual office of Vancouver in the next civic election. It's difficult to pinpoint when things went wrong for Alex and Decimbriani. But his glittering public image began to deteriorate in the mid-1970s as a result of media investigations, particularly in the Vancouver Sun columns of Alan Fotheringham, who dug into Cimbriani's past and revealed, revealed he was not who he said he was. As it turns out, upon arriving in Vancouver, he changed his name from Ralph Sims. He was, an, he was not an orphan. In fact, he'd been brought up in part of a large family in Hamilton. A series of complaints re uh, revealed that he was not the enterprising businessman who looked out for the little guy. Rather, he was a hostile landlord who had uh, had a number of physical altercations with his tenants. Uh, well, actually, one of them was an old lady, as a matter of fact. Over the years, uh, uh, while, he, while the reward he offered for LaRue's murder was still up for grabs, December's political dreams were dashed overnight. The mayor of the West End never recovered. In the 1990s, Decimbriani pled guilty to defrauding more than 50 uh, investors, including many of his old social credit party cronies, notably Premier Bill Van Der Zam and eight VPD officers. A dark final blow to his reputation came when he was found guilty of sex crimes involving three teenage boys aged 14 to 16 at the time of the offenses and sentenced to a year in jail. Alex Decimbriani, or Ralph Sims, or whoever he was, died in 1999. The $10,000 reward he'd offered 25 years prior was never claimed, and the murder of Serge LaRue was never solved. It was a good time uh, in the police department to have a mustache in the 1970s. <laughs> I, think I think all of them there. I had to double check to see if the lady had one there, too, actually. <laughs> this, is, uh, uh, this is a group of, of, of a officers that were part of a, a, a particular crime unit that uh, could roam around essentially in the West End. They weren't part of the vice squad. They weren't part of the major crime homicide squad or anything like that, but they could basically sort of float around, perhaps supplement other squads during a given night, vary from night to night. And the two gentlemen that are at the far uh, left over here, the guy in the gray sweater with the uh, walrus uh, mustache, there's a guy by the name of Al Robson who figures quite highly in the book. He also appears in a bit of a cameo in my other book, Last Gang in Town. Quite a character. In fact, if you worked for the Vancouver Police Department in any of the years that Al was there, you probably have a quote unquote Al Robson story uh, because he was, uh, he was quite a colorful guy. The guy sitting next to him in a leather jacket is a guy by the name of Gord Bader. They both joined the police department in 1971, the year I was born. And they uh, sort of move up the ranks, and uh, by 1977 are working in the West End, uh, uh, supplementing um, some, of the, uh, some of the vice squad investigations that were going on at the time. Um, in the beginning, they're actually stationed down at the uh, West End uh, uh, English Bay Bathhouse. Um, which is being used as a cruising spot by some members of the gay community. It had been for years, but by the late 1970s, it was a, being a little bit, it was becoming a little bit overt, and everybody kind of knew there was people who had gone into the washroom there and had been propositioned uh, and, and whatnot, that uh, the police were sort of, eventually had to do something about it. Like any party gets out of hand, police show up. Uh, and that happens at a house party as much as it does at a cruising spot, I suppose. Or at least it did then. And it was interesting to, uh, it wasn't really the greatest detail that most police officers, especially in that era, you know, uh, hoped to get. Um, and, but it was interesting to hear from both Robson and Bader who were, basically had to go sort of undercover and sort of hide in the washroom and try and catch somebody in the act uh, to, to stop the problem. That's what they were directed to do. They kind of thought it was a waste of time. Uh, they didn't like doing it. Um, and they were happy to, it was over. 
around this time too, they were also, um, they were also uh, stationed at the Hudson's Bay Building because apparently on the fourth floor restroom and talking to some older members of Vancouver Gay Community, everybody, this was amazing to hear. Everybody sort of, well, everybody knew that was going on. Apparently the, in, the, in the washroom on the fourth floor was a very common cruising spot. Um, that if you, you know, went to buy a pair of pants at the uh, Hudson's Bay and you popped in there, maybe you'd see a couple of fellas there or something, you know, it just seemed, but this, these places had sort of, it's part of the, sort of the secret gay history of Vancouver, I suppose, that we know not that much about, that we would, you know, it'd be, it'd be interesting to find out so much more about it. Um, interesting to hear some of the, when I, as I interviewed some of the people who, uh, uh, Vancouverites of a certain vintage who remembered those years, those years within the gay community, that this was all very well-known spots going back years. Of course, you know, some of the gay night spots hadn't really necessarily come to pass. They were just starting to, they'd been around. But uh, they were only taking on more public nature, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, as I say, Robson and Bader did not necessarily enjoy uh, this detail. Especially, there were many nights uh, where they were picking up uh, underage kids. Uh, and so there were many nights where they were, uh, you know, uh, arresting uh, married men. Uh, and when they brought them down to the police department and, the, uh, and their wives came down to bail them out of jail, uh, they were... You, they were sort of horrified about, because there were a lot of crying, there was a lot of embarrassment. And they started, uh, they started hearing that a lot of these men were committing suicide before they went to trial. They simply didn't want to deal with it. Sort of awful situation. The police department didn't make any announcement about this, but when they learned about this, as, as Robson told me, they quietly just stopped the program altogether. They said, this is having, and to their credit, this is having sort of unintended consequences. Why don't we just put some more light down there so it's a little bit more, not so secret spot to get to, and this will solve the problem. And that's what they did. Um, but not before some people, um, some people killed themselves. It's a tough era for the attitudes between um, the Vancouver Police Department and the gay community at the time. It's probably the low, one of the lowest uh, points in the relationship uh, between those two communities where uh, Many people in the gay community felt their, the Vancouver Police Department were, were targeting them specifically, and you know, sort of setting up stings and whatnot. And um, you talk to individual officers; they're going to give you their own personal answer. Some of them, even today, you'll you'll find well, you'll find a bit of prejudice in their in their tone. This is a, unfortunately the era that they're from. Other guys talk about how it was a, you know we never went down there with agenda. I didn't like doing it. These people are just like you and I. Why are we doing this? but they were given orders to go out and, 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 uh, and do this. So very often in some of the gay nightclubs that were emerging, like Faces at Seymour, 795 Seymour Street, sometimes the police would do a walkthrough and be a little bit brusque with everybody, sort of threatened to take names uh, uh, down there, which is the reason why the, one person told me at Faces, a little sign-in sheet, a little, it was a private club, so you had to sign in your name. When you came in, there was about 30 Judy Garlands that had written their name on any given night uh, that were there. Faces, we're just talking about it, 795 Seymour. Um, it's interesting because one of the, um, uh, it, it, at this time as well, when all these other things are going on, it's, it's, it's amazing because there's a, this is sort of the era of some of the first real gay night spots emerging and, and that beginning to take a more public shape. Um, uh, Faces was originally a place called uh, Twiggies and later the 795 Club. And then finally Faces, and it was in the Aurelia Rooms building. Many people have seen photos of that, that sort of beautiful, ornate uh, building that was down uh, on Robson that I think was, hailed, was about from 1910. And finally, I think it was demolished in 1985, if memory serves. <clears throat> and um, another, uh, another place was the Playpen South. I love this photo. Uh, it's a wild night here at, at the Playpen South, which, is, which was at 1369 Richards, which people of my uh, era that were playing in bands and uh, hanging out in clubs in the 1990s, like my buddy Nathan here, uh, we remember it as a place called the Globe that was down at sort of the foot of, uh, of Richards and Pacific. And um, uh, it was around, it, it was demolished, I think, probably in the very early 2000s or, or very late 90s. Um, it's funny because uh, there's a story that I tell in the book where Al Robson was uh, in uniform that night, actually, and he was, they, had a, they had a warrant looking for a, a guy that was believed to be out that night, and they went to some of the clubs, and, the, and Robson went into the Playpen South. On the very same night, they had a police-themed night, and 
Robson went in, you know, in, in his full, you know, police uniform, and of course immediately attracted the attention. Who thought, "Wow, he's got a realistic uniform. <laughs> that looks great." And he, you know, Robson was pretty blithely. Well, I'll just, I'm just going to ask the bartender, and I was making some inquiries with the bartender. He got sort of one too many pinches in the bum. He thought, "Maybe this isn't the best night for me to be here. I'll come back. I'll come back tomorrow or, or something like that." Uh, but uh, but kind of amusing. And another uh, a very well remembered spot and sort of part of the history that, that eventually sort of disappears in the city is the, um, is the Taurus bathhouse. This is a membership card from, that for my friend, uh, Andre Tardif, who, um, this was above uh, a, a hotel, this was probably the bottom of a, of a hotel um, that eventually there was a fire there in, uh, on Valentine's night, 1992, that burned down the whole building. But this is a very well remembered um, place within the gay community and where some of the characters within Vancouver Vice sort of uh, uh, are in and out of. Ron Dutton, uh, I wanted to give a little sort of shout out to him. He was a historian and activist that had basically in his own home had uh, organized uh, from a number of clippings, kept clippings, kept posters of kind of the gay history of Vancouver, which he has since uh, donated to the Vancouver Archives. And now, thanks to the friends of the Vancouver Archives, all that stuff has been scanned and you can look at it online now. And it's a considerable resource and amazing that he kept all this stuff in his place. And I, I, I think that's just one shelf that he had. They probably had about four others in his place over the years that he had uh, in Mingo. But some, I think some of the, our, our knowledge and some of the history of this scene is only going to be sort of more revealed to us more now that this is in a sort of an official collection. So much of the period of, of this that's interesting to remember or, or to note is that it was a, certainly a different uh, time of morals in Vancouver. Um, if you're born and raised in Vancouver like me, I remember as a teenager, you'd see a lot of street preachers down on Granville Street. Um, you'll remember that when Caligula uh, aired at the town cinema down on Granville Street, Bernice Girard, uh, who's not an easy person to forget, uh, came down and protested uh, outside the theater that a movie, that this, you know, this movie was Caligula was being shown. Um, I don't know if that, it would take a lot today to see a, that happen ever again in the city. You know, we've, uh, we've globally we seem to have moved on to that, but, but particularly in Vancouver, the, those same, the, that, for lack of a better word, piousness that was in Vancouver in those years has completely gone, but it was certainly in, 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 in well play then. Um, there weren't any sort of porno movies in Vancouver. You had to go down to Point Roberts to check those out. Uh, and even magazine stores like this one, this is from a, uh, uh, this is a photo from a, a Vice Squad uh, 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 investigation in March 1971, where they raided, um, they raided the store for offensive titles. Uh, and this had happened over the years in Vancouver, there was actually a raid in 1964 uh, at the Fraser Book Bin um, that was, I think, it was down in Granville, sort of just down by Granville and Davy. Um, it was run by Ted Fraser, where he was charged along with three employees for the stocking of books, and I'll read these titles out. Whip Me Some More, Milady, Pals of Pain, Court of Spanking Relations, and Sitting Teacher, along with Catcher, uh, copies of Catcher in the Rye. And it's interesting that a year, uh, just a year, uh, Later, Bill Duffy was charged for having uh, Hubert Selby's last exit to Brooklyn stocked in Duffy books, um, and he was taken to court on that. And he fought that all the way to the Supreme Court, and he lost. Now, that's back when probably you can afford to stage a Supreme Court trial, maybe uh, if you were just a bookseller. I don't think you could do it today. I don't think anybody would have the heart or the, t or the temerity to run that case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada if they were charged with, uh, with that. Um, but he did. Uh, within a couple years later, there was this landmark trial in the UK where they basically determined books like Catcher in the Rye were uh, not offensive. And they, you know, the, 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 there was a correction on that. But in 1977, Mayor Jack Volridge led a team of vice squad uh, investigators and they went down to Granville Street and raided bookstores and, you know, for offensive titles that were believed. Now, these were not Catcher in the Rye, these were sort of porno magazines at the time. but. Again, this is sort of, it's interesting to think about that period that I, I don't know, I mean, anything you can find online is a lot more risque than that, that I don't, I don't think there's been an offensive, obscene material case that's presented to the VPD in maybe 40 years. Um, if, if, it, if there is one, I'm, 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 I'm not aware of it. I'd like to know, find out what it was. But as I say, at different time, there's another uh, photo, some of, the, some of the magazine titles are hilarious here actually, but I won't, 
read them out for, because it's a family audience tonight. But Vancouverites of a certain era will remember uh, Ernie Ruff's van uh, that he drove around. I remember seeing this as a kid so much I could see some nodding glances and people who remember this car. For those of you who don't have, remember this or haven't seen it before, Ernie Ruff, who was a guy, um, uh, he was, I think he was from Vancouver Island or uh, up the coast or some, near Seachelt maybe. Can't remember exactly. Um, some, some years ago, um, in the early 1970s, he went down to the penthouse. He was going to drink a whole hell of a lot and maybe meet a girl and take where the evening came from. And God spoke to him at the penthouse. I don't know if God paid admission at the penthouse. I was going to ask <laughs> Danny Filipponi that. But apparently, God spoke to him in the penthouse and said, this is what you need to do with the rest of your life. And uh, he went out, bought uh, a, a basically an aircraft, um, uh, the little gang where you walk up, the, the little thing that moves the stairs in and out, bought that truck and then put these signs up and drove around Vancouver, basically letting people know that the end was nigh and they need to repent. Um, th this was a regular scene in Vancouver. I, I remember seeing it driving around with my dad and seeing it. I, I don't think that guy's going to make that right-hand turn. That thing's so big and, and, and whatnot. But this was, a, this, was a this was a present scene so often in around these years, too. And uh, he cruised up and down Davy Street in these years, too, back, back in those years as well. Um, it's interesting to mention the penthouse because a 1975 police investigation of the penthouse nightclub by the vice squad and the head of the vice squad at the time, it was a guy by the name of Vic Lake, uh, basically shut down the penthouse. The uh, penthouse was, the police did VPD surveillance on uh, the front door of the penthouse for the summer of 1975, taking photographs of everybody that came in and out of the place. And aside from lots of nightclub goers and sex workers, there were a few aldermen and uh, from uh, the city and some neighboring ones. I've seen the police reports. I have them now. And, uh, and you know, some sports figures, a couple of BC Lions. It looked like they were having a ball there a few nights. Uh, but basically, this brought charges against the, the notoriously the Penthouse Six. I get into that in the Penthouse book much more than I'm going to talk about here. But to make a long story short, it shut down the Penthouse for three years. And the Penthouse had been a place where sex workers had basically, it was an unofficial red light district, at least for the women. Um, and you could go down there, and if you went in, maybe 8 o'clock, you might be the only guy there that early, but there'd be a room full of 50 women ready to, for you to meet uh, and give you a receipt uh, for meeting them, as I might add. Um, so when that closed, it pushed a lot of the street, a lot of what became street prostitution out the street. We'd had that before, especially in the downtown east side, but never in the way that it happened in the wake of that penthouse uh, trial. And the prostitutes uh, and sex workers, uh, they were called prostitutes, then we call them sex workers now. I was trying to make that d distinction in the book. Uh, quite a lot, a lot of people that say, in, I have to quote, because they said hooker in 1977, but now we call them sex workers. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting because it spread it all over the city. Up Davy Street, but also on Georgia Street. And right, this is a, a, one of the Vice Squad members uh, in the Hotel Vancouver, looking down. You can tell sort of what where he where he is, looking down there with the Georgia Hotel over in the corner there and whatnot. Um, and Hudson's Bay building uh, at the far end of the street. Um, and now it started to spread all over the city, um, where it, many police officers, senior VPD people that I've spoken to in recent years, they all talk about how what a waste of time, what a terrible decision that was, because it just created more problems on the street. Prostitution wasn't street, and sex work was a little bit different. It was uh, back in these years, if it was happening anywhere, it wasn't necessarily happening on the street where people would see it. It was very often in bars or hotel lounges and stuff like this. This is why the hotel detective was employed, to sort of look around and root out these people and whatnot. Don't have anybody work as a hotel detective now, I think. It, would be a, it sounds like a fun position in a, in a weird way. But uh, that's was the, that was sort of the way that it was handled then. But in the wake of the, of the penthouse uh, case, it certainly pushed them out all over the street and, and, and all over uh, the city in that regard. Um, August 1977, <clears throat> a reporter named Marcus G uh, is, uh, does a ride along with Al Robson and Gord Bader. And uh, G is now a senior columnist with the Globe and Mail, but he was on his summer uh, internship with the Vancouver province at this point and uh, submitted this article based on what he'd heard from Bader and Robson that night. Um, and Bader and Robson claimed there were about 200 male prostitutes, adolescent male prostitutes, working in, in the downtown cores, or right around the Davy Street area, particularly around a few specific corners. Um, when this headline hit the 
uh, people's front porches on Monday morning, um, Bader and Robson were called into called to the carpet and asked to explain where they got these numbers from. And they said, look, this is, this is what we're seeing. And in the wake of that, they got, they got quite a lot of flack because the media now asked the mayor what's going on. I, you know, we didn't have these numbers. We didn't realize this was a problem. At the time, it was just sort of brushed aside within a few days. It was, some people said, oh, it was an overestimation or whatnot. But the police chief at the time said, okay, if you think there's that many guys out there, you count them. You go out and find out about this. And Bader and Robson, who had already been on that police detail, then in that summer, started trying to find out more about this investigation, which leads them to a guy by the name of Wayne Harris. And uh, Harris was a, uh, was a pimp in the West End who was basically turning out adolescent boys is the best, best way I, I can explain this. Uh, this is probably the more sordid material and some of the more sordid stories of the book. Most of the, uh, most of the kids, which is what they were, that were under his wing, um, most of them are dead now. Um, AIDS swept through that world in a very harsh way in the early 1980s. Um, and the ones that did want to talk, didn't want to have their names printed in the book, their lives have moved on and whatnot. I can certainly understand that. But as Bader and Robson began to hear the name of Wayne Harris on the streets of Davy Street in the summer of 1977, they started to hear that sort of his long reach and who he was connected with. It's interesting that he was hiring some of the kids to basically get, procure stolen goods for him, which he would fence. Uh, at the same time, it turns out that he was working as an informant for the police department. When it, when it suited him. And when, he, when somebody said, look, you, you know, you, Wayne, you've been found with this stolen material, then he would cough up some names or another investigation. Very slithery figure. Um, Harris is charged with uh, living off the avails of prostitution along with his wife um, and uh, a, a number of others. Um, and he goes to jail for a year and a half. Um, but the police investigation continues. And it's found that uh, there did a number of wiretaps on Harris's uh, phone, uh, which led them to a guy by the name of Hal Keller. And Keller uh, had been one of uh, Harris's big clients or asking for um, people for his parties that he was hiding as, having at his place out, on, uh, out in Kitsilano. And Harris, uh, pardon me, Keller himself was the founder of the You Frame It a chain. Some of you might remember the you frame it stores that were around where you could bring a poster in and they'd set you up with the, you know, the parts for the, and you'd put the poster together and you'd make your own sort of frame for the poster. It was an amazingly lucrative business. He had maybe a dozen of these uh, stores across Canada and even I think one in Hawaii, uh, as a matter of fact. And he, bega he comes to uh, police attention in, in those years. Again, these are tough years. The T-shirt that the girl's wearing is, by the way, Van Pigs Suck, uh, for those of you who couldn't read the picture. This is a vice squad member who is uh, interviewing um, a sex worker in the West End. Uh, again, uh, everything is now coming to a head in the, as we move from the 1970s into the early 80s. That by 1981, um, the barricades are now being pushed into the West End. Now, in the beginning, there were sort of these chain barricades. Now, they look more like those little parklets or those little pathways that they are in the West End. People walk around all the time. They don't know that they were connected to this era. In a way, they're not connected to that as well, because the reason for bringing these things in were first decided in 1973 uh, as traffic calming measures. Um, but by 1977, the city was so, uh, and probably by 1981, were so looking to find some excuse that they were dealing with the prostitution problem in some way that they kind of rejiggered the announcement of this and said these are actually for to, to stop the cars cruising around the West End uh, going by certain corners where the sex workers were working at. Um, and uh, it's interesting when we look back at what really happened, you, you know, it, or what we decided to do to sort of try and solve this problem of, of sex work happening in residential areas. Almost every decision we made at the time was the wrong one to do. We screwed this up time and time again. Um, that in the beginning, when it was just in some of these apartment buildings, like Madame Fru, who had her uh, brothel that in, in a couple of apartment buildings in the West End, when that was discovered, they were pushed out on the streets. And when it then moved on to Davy Street, people didn't like that on the main street. Then it got pushed into the residential streets. 
And then once it pushed in the residential streets and people were dealing with it then, and getting sick of the cars that were driving around, uh, you know, looking to pick them up, and uh, which in the end did nothing except sort of slow traffic down to give the gals a little more time to negotiate a price, apparently. Uh, again, we, we did, everything we did just d decided to, was the wrong, seemingly the wrong move. Um, I'll get what, to what might have been the right move here in the end and why that might not have uh, ever happened. But by the early 80s, now we have the Shame the Johns campaign, which again, some of you in the West End residents or people living in Vancouver at the time will remember. It's, while people remember, they don't necessarily remember how big this got, or there would be the sort of Orwellian uh, uh, billboards that were right on Davy Street there. Um, the, 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 the interesting thing about the, the legacy of the Shame the Johns campaign is that now they're looked at as simply sort of almost sort of as they get called neighborhood vigilantes who were uh, who pushed the sex workers out of the West End. They just uh, uh, were conservative residents who had no respect or uh, desire to even deal with these people at all. In the beginning, the Shame John campaign really starts actually from a, a Rick Houston, a, a, a Vancouver Sun a columnist who wrote about this and complaining about the number of underaged sex workers that were around that time. And the movement begins to get sort of co-opted um, by more of the irate West End uh, neighborhood people. That, that, uh, and to their credit, you know, a lot of the people that, that supported the Shane the Johns campaign did so from not the angle that we necessarily consider that legacy today. At the height of the controversy, um, there, was a West, there were a couple of West End, West End residents, James Oak, along with Kate Trotter, who were both reporters for the West Ender. Um, as Trotter, who lived near the uh, center of the action at the time, remembers that most of us weren't angry about the hookers. They'd been a part of the street scene for a decade or more. It had gotten worse over the years, and the tricks and the yahoos coming down to watch the action who were the ones that made it unbearable. All I wanted was a good night's sleep. There are all these sort of reports in, in, in both the in television and, and, and radio and, and newsprint just about how, um, uh, how the noise of the neighborhood and how Again, it wasn't necessarily the sex workers themselves, but there were so many people just coming down to, to look at the traffic or see what was going on or scream out at the people in the street. In the 1960s, people drove around Kitsilano from people from Shaughnessy and Caresdale, where I grew up, came down to Kitsilano to look at the hippies. In 1977, we were going down and looking at the hot prostitutes and whatnot, looking at sex workers. And that was the zoo that we, we had moved to, uh, seemingly, in this city. Um, I mentioned, uh, I, I, I me this all begins sort of a, a lot of controversy, and it, it's this, there's a swelling attitude that it's interesting, you know, by the early 80s um, and, and by 1984, um, you, have, you have a time when people believe that police have lost control of their neighborhoods. There's also a strange new virus that's out there that we don't know a lot about, not necessarily know how you get it. There's a Trudeau in office. The more things change, the more they're staying the same, perhaps, as the last few years would tell. But it's, it's, uh, it's interesting that to, to look back at a lot of the, the, the newspaper columns at the time and just see how, uh, how turbulent it got and how basically the, the neighborhood sort of went to war uh, against itself. Till that it finally, in, in the summer of 1984, an injunction, uh, a court injunction was, was brought and it uh, basically pushed all the sex workers out of the West End and they had to move at least past, uh, they couldn't work anywhere west of Granville Street. That pushed them for a time into uh, the Mount Pleasant area, came back downtown, maybe you remember Seymour Street in the 80s uh, and 90s, uh, where it was happening then, but eventually a lot of the, those streets that used to house auto parts stores and old warehouses are now 30-story condos now, and they pushed the, uh, a lot of the sex workers out. You can, you can fight the police, but you can't fight your strata committee. That's, a, that's the way the lesson you can learn from that. Um, <laughs> Again, there, there were these sort of huge protests at the time that we sort of seemed, it's interesting how much we've forgotten. Um, and not only the, the, uh, the neighborhood themselves and the, and the concerned residents of the West End, Crow is their acronym, um, but the Shane the Johns people as well. There was sort of shared some membership, but uh, they were two distinct groups. Um, that even Mayor Mike Harcourt. Um, some of these photos, by the way, are, are from the Crow archives, which have never been published before, uh, that are found in the book. And um, some great, uh, great letter jackets there that I kind of dig, but <laughs> but uh, but it really attracted a lot of um, uh, a lot of media attention and uh, and whatnot. What really ended it? What really ended it was not so much the injunction. Again, the many of the sex workers just got pushed in that area of town. 
there are people, again, who, who really purport that that, um, uh, that move event basically is the first domino that falls that pushes many sex workers up to Willie Picton's front door. Um, lots of people argue against that as well, but it's an interesting point that's made. What really, but it's interesting, the injunction was essentially successful, and overnight, uh, as one police officer told me, I went down, he went down to the West End right after the injunction happened, and he said, you could, you could fire a cannonball down Davie Street, and nobody, nobody was there. The tra all that traffic ha had disappeared. Um, it was effective. It might have been a sledgehammer of a, of a decision of justice, but um, it, did ha it did have that desired effect that overnight, the problem went away. Now, street prostitution, of course, continues you know, for years afterwards. You don't see it much anymore today. In fact, there's no vice squad in the Vancouver Police Department today. It doesn't exist anymore. It's now called the Counter Exploitation Unit. And now it specifically goes after pimps and whatnot. But there hasn't been, there's been a few charges here and there over the last few years for living off the avails, but you can count them on one hand. Um, it's interesting that the, the police department, I talked to one of the guys on the, the counter exploitation unit today who, who talked about, you know, the, the technology really is, is the thing that changed in the beginning. Even beepers were a thing that necessarily didn't need to be out in the street all the time. You could just get a phone call if you were a sex worker. Um, later on, it, it moves online, and that's what so much of their work does is today that moves online. I still see some street prostitution down in the downtown east side, of course. I don't know if that's going to go away. I don't know if it's ever going to fully go away. But to ask what, you know, how things change and could this ever happen again, really the planets would need to really align a very different way to, to, to bring this all back. It's hard to believe um, that, uh, that this situation could ever essentially happen again, even though now we're, again, asking uh, a lot of questions in terms of street crime and, uh, and stranger violence in, in Vancouver about you know, what are the police doing to stop this? Some of the same comments, some of the same attitudes and questions being asked. This, they could be lifted right out of the headlines from the 1970s and early 80s. Um, the book starts with a murder, like all good stories. Um, and I, I, I don't necessarily want to give away too much, because there's a little bit of a murder mystery that draws a through line through the book. But in Stanley Park on May, uh, just around North Lagoon Road, um, uh, in May of 1984, this car was found um, with a body in the trunk. And these are photos that the Vancouver Police Department, uh, the people at the, at, the, at the privacy office who you file a Freedom of Information request, they don't understand how I got these, and they're very mad that I probably have them. Uh, it's very hard to get, as, as my friend John Belshaw will attest to with his Vancouver Noir book, it's very hard to get uh, crime photos in Vancouver that sort of show anything. Um, it's, it's, it's often joked that if, you're, if there's a photo, let's say, of somebody who jumped off a building, uh, if the, person, if the person, landed, person landed face up, that you can see their face and maybe identify them, well, they're not going to give you that. But if they land face down, maybe they'll give it to you because of the nature of privacy things. We're very, they're very concerned, very conservative about privacy. In, in fact, these photos were given to me by uh, somebody who was on a major crime squad that kept photos and kept, so they were horrified. As I say, the VPD are horrified that I, that I had this, or they wonder what else I, I, I managed to get that they, they wouldn't give me. But uh, it's sort of a linchpin of the book. And I don't want to necessarily give away, I'd, I'd be giving away spoilers if I necessarily um, talked about the book. But I will read a little excerpt um, that, uh, that might be fun to kind of leave you with here. And then we can get to some questions if people have them. One second here. Um, again, that morning, and the book talks in the first chapter about the number of uh, different police investigators who are summoned down to, um, to the scene of the crime uh, in May 84. And some very well-known uh, people, um, uh, including Coroner Larry Campbell, uh, shows up on the scene um, as well. But um, I'll, uh, I'll read just a sort of a little bit of an excerpt uh, uh, that maybe shows how different uh, things were. Contemporary homicide investigations are markedly different from those in the 1980s. If the same homicide had occurred today, it probably would have led to the mobilization of at least 20 additional police officers to cordon off the area and perform a ground search to comb for evidence 40 or 50 feet back into the bush of Stanley Park. 
Today, forensic computer te technicians with 3D scanning technology are regularly deployed to a crime scene to create si uh, simulations and maps. And the investigation results in enough boxes of reports, notes, photographs, interview transcripts, and documents to fill an entire storage room. But in 1984, aside from an immediate search of the area, a few photographs of the car and the surrounding scene, some notes and diagrams, and a handful of interview transcripts, a 1980s homicide case often didn't fill much more than a single large size legal size folder. In this particular situa situation, perhaps a greater search of the area simply wasn't considered necessary. Much of the immediate crime scene seemed to speak for itself. It was certainly clear that the cause of death wasn't accidental because of the blunt force trauma the victim sustained and because the, he'd been shoved into the trunk of a car. And from the lack of blood around the scene of the vehicle compared to what was isolated in the trunk, police suspected this spot wasn't the original location of the murder. Doctors from the VPD pathology department at the scene officially pronounced the victim dead and determined that the death appeared not to have occurred in recent hours, but likely a day or two previous. The telltale odor of a body uh, dead for a while stored in an enclosed space in warm weather was certainly not unfamiliar to the veteran police officers present. One didn't need a university accredited forensic science background to recognize that smell. Joggers and people on the evening stroll around Stanley Park began to stop along the police tape to get a closer look. Some of the officers recognized the victim inside the trunk. Casual speculation had begun among them about who this person was and that he was known to police. At this point, one more officer arrived, walked up to the rear of the vehicle, and saw unveiled from behind some bloody blankets the body of the victim. And that's when the rain that had been forecast for the day began to fall. Staff Sergeant Rich Rollins from the Major Crime Section had marked his 17th anniversary with the Vancouver Police Department the day before. He would become the senior officer in this investigation. I spent a lot of years on homicide investigations and I saw a lot of ops ops, he said Rollins, recalling the day in May almost 40 years earlier. This ended up being one of the most interesting cases I ever worked. And just when I thought it would get more bizarre, it did. Um, as I say, the, the, the injunction happens in 1984, and, and, but one of the interesting documents that, was, that I found in this area was something that was leaked to me that connected uh, Harris to a number of very well-known people uh, in Vancouver, they're both alive and dead now. When I submitted my first manuscript to my publisher, they said, um, Aaron, we're gonna have to sort of have a second look at, their, at your ending here because we're gonna get sued if we print all this. Um, which I understood, I was a little sort of chagrined at first, but I realized you gotta nuance this stuff and I don't wanna be a, a, a scandal monger necessarily. But it was, this document was leaked to me that, um, that when presented to both Bader and Robson, the investigators, Rons, the ones that had done uh, uh, the investigation in the murder I just mentioned, as well as Hal Keller, uh, everybody said to me, A, how did you get your hands on this? And B, you've done a better detective job than we did, Aaron, because we didn't know any of this at the time. Um, mostly because they were seconded to other departments. They were shifted around after being on one investigation for a few months, they got, they got put onto another. But uh, it's, a revealing, it's a revealing document of, of the times and what happened uh, in the West End in those years. Of course, the West End today is completely different today. And as I say, um, it, uh, it would be very hard to imagine the same set of circumstances creating the situation that happened in the West End today. And now, as people ask me, what are my sort of predictions for the city, that the West End will um, become the new Yale town. False Creek will, be, will become the new West End. Um, probably the downtown east side is going to stay the same and nothing's going to change for that until the big earthquake comes and shakes all the monopoly pieces off the board and we start again in Vancouver. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that is essentially the, uh, you know, the thought. It's an interesting time to look back on in, in, in this era and uh, while we started with the West End Sex Workers Memorial and some of the assertions that uh, Becky Ross, who's a friend, and Jamie Hamilton is a friend of mine too, uh, suggested. I, where I part company with them was the suggestion that there were no pimps in Vancouver and there were no bad actors in Vancouver and there were people who were, who were definitely predators out there. And to simplify the nature and make it sound as idyllic as it was um, is essentially, I don't want to accuse them wrongly, but this is a, that's, a, that's a very tough reimagining of history. The truth is a lot more complex and I hope some of that truth is answered in Vancouver Vice. I have one last story to tell you, which is that I visited a young boy, young man in hospital today, very, he's an orphan, very sick, and I went to his bedside and he said, Aaron, if you can just sell all the books you brought tonight, 
at the Vancouver Historical Society meeting, I might feel just a little bit better. <laughs> And I looked at him with his big eyes, and I say, well, I don't know. I, 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 you know, people today, it's tough times. You know, it's, it's uh, inflation as it is. And his, but he, looked, he said, I know there's going to be some good people there tonight. <laughs> if they could just buy all the books you brought, then you could just go home with an empty suitcase, and you'll be fine. I said, well, Timmy, I think that was his name. <laughs> I'll try. Thank you very much for coming tonight, everybody.